We are excited about our first inaugural Fundamental Roots and Friends. And um, so what, what we are excited about is that our goal is to have guests and Dr. Thompson has very kindly agreed to be our first guest on Fundamental Roots and Friends and he's at work. So we really appreciate his time. And so the goal of this Fundamental Roots and Friends is to really kind of highlight some of the different points that we make in the book that we wrote that Dr. Wilkins and I wrote together, The Art of Effective Position Communication. And um, yay. And Dr. Thompson actually was one of our reviewers. So we really, really appreciated that and, and to receive his feedback on the book. And our goal is to highlight these different points that we've made in the book with different guests and kind of really learn and hear from physicians directly um, what their perspectives are in regards to what we talked about in that book. So um, I would like to turn it to Dr. Wilkins to introduce Dr. Thompson because he is a dear friend of yours. So yes, I yes. Thank you, Haiti. Um, so I'm extremely excited. Um, Dr. Thompson, again, is a personal friend. He's a mentor. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not here. I'm here. I'm actually beside myself because I'm so excited. Dr. Thompson has been awarded, and this is a long time coming. And Dr. Thompson, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm sorry, I'm, I've got to brag. Um, <laughs> and I have been partners together. He's an acute care surgeon at Cobble in West Virginia, uh, University of West Virginia. And this week, Hot Off the Press has been named a uh, full professor of surgery um, at Cobble. So we're so excited for Dr. Thompson, uh, very well deserved. Uh, when you become a full professor of surgery, you have to show academic um, pursuits, you, um, academic instruments, academic Excellence, maybe? Thank you. See, see what I mean? <laughs> always teaching. Always teaching. Um, but Dr. Thompson teaches medical students, residents, um, mentors like myself. He's involved in multiple um, medical societies, um, surgical societies, medical societies, editors of mag I mean, we don't have enough time to go over his, his resume. But just very, very excited and proud for you, Dr. Thompson, and very glad for you to be on the, on the program. And the reason we brought you on the program is, um, you know, we've, we've had this, this concept that there are, when you're dealing with physicians, that number one, physicians are humans. And then the second thing is that all humans have six basic human needs. And those six basic human needs are certainty and safety, love and connection, variety, growth, significance, and contribution. And these are outlined in our book, as you know. But the reason why we wanted you to speak to certainty and safety is because we've always felt, I've always felt, that certain that physicians derive a sense of safety from data, at least professionally. Uh, this is something you and I have talked about a lot, and you are the one that has ingrained in me that in God we trust, everyone else shows me the data. <laughs> Am I right about that? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the introduction. And I will tell you that uh, I'm very happy to, that I made full professor. Um, it's been something I've been, of course, pursuing for a long time. Um, so thank you very much. It's good to be here. Uh, if you haven't read the book, um, I would highly uh, recommend it to everyone. And as far as data goes, I, th I think that we all want to do a good job with our patients. We want our patients to do well. And in order to do uh, the best we can for our patients, we would like to have, we would like to give them the, the best medical care possible. And in order to do that, we have to have data. We have to be able to say to them, or at least to ourselves, that we are giving you the state of the art um, the, the newest of the new and the best of the best. And, and the way we can do that is to uh, read the data and try to apply the data to our patients the best we can. So Dr. Um, Thompson, what kind of data is, how, I mean, is it any data? How do you evaluate the quality of your data? So that, that is, that, as you know, that's a complex question. And in these days where we're dealing with the uh, coronavirus, um, we have a lot of 
um, anecdotal data. Um, basically, people who say, this is what I've done. It isn't randomized. It's not a prospective trial. It is just, this is what I've done, and I think it sort of kind of works. Um, and so we try to use the best data we can to take care of our patients. For example, if you have a patient who has acute appendicitis, who has, for example, some sort of um, mental problems, just doesn't quite think quite right. There's no data suggesting that patients with um, mental retardation do worse. So we're going to try to apply the general um, the, the general data that we've read in a textbook or we've read in a paper to this patient. And we do this all the time. We see patients who have a particular problem, but yet the data that we've read does not exactly fit their problem. And we try to use the best data we can. That is all we can do is to use the best data we can and try to apply it. And sometimes we're wrong. Hopefully most times we're right. And isn't that really the key, Dr. Thompson, is that um, when, we, when we look at data and when we look to data to, to um, give us that sense of certainty and safety, it very much is about the quality of the data. And particularly if you have two different data to choose from. So for instance, something I saw on Dr. Google versus something that I saw in the last issue of critical care medicine. No, you're exactly right. You have to be able to weigh the data you want to use the best data you can. Um, Dr. Google is usually not that good. Um, on the other hand, something that's in critical care medicine that may not directly apply to your patient may not be that much better. But you have to be able to evaluate the data, weigh it, and then apply your best guess, I guess you would say, um, to what is best for your patient. And sometimes it is your, uh, your um, experience. For example, if you've taken care of a thousand patients with, with acute appendicitis, you may have as good an experience as anybody who's writing a paper on acute appendicitis, right? You've seen a ton of it. Right. Um, the question is, in your retrospective knowledge of all of that, are you going to evaluate those patients uh, as critically as you can to apply that, or are you going to say the last patient I took care of did great, so this is what I'm going to do? I think that that's one real good thing that you point up is that um, if you did not see a thousand patients, but you know someone who saw a thousand patients, and there's no data around that, you may pick up the phone and call that person who's had a thousand patients. And I think you and I do that all the time. I have a phone a friend. A phone a friend uh, concept where sometimes if I'm in a situation where I particularly haven't seen, I mean, I've been doing this for 34 years, I still will come upon, upon paces where I haven't seen this before. And so to give me a sense of safety, I may say, wait a minute, I remember Dr. Thompson telling me about something like this. I'll pick up that phone and say, tell me about your experience. Because for me, I know if you've seen this several times, you are our validation for me for that your sense of safety for me to proceed. So I think that that's another thing that's, that's good. You know, talking to somebody who you respect, who you think may have as good of, if not better data than you do, or may just validate the ideas that you have. I think either one is, 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 a, is a good way of, of um, I'm trying to get the picture just right, and it's not. It's not you look working. fantastic, actually. Like, because you're a professor, it makes sense that I would look up to you. So that is that what it is? <laughs> I think it's just perfect. I love it. So, so I, again, what we're trying to do is trying to do the best we can for our patients. We want to get the best data available. So, if you can call up the guy who's written the paper on a thousand. Um, appendectomies and get his experience, then that's great. If, if instead you've got a friend who has that same type of experience and you want to call your friend, then that's also good. I think you, you want to, again, get the best information you can to take care of your patients. You know, Dr. Thompson, when Haiti and I um, encounter this the most within the context of organ donation, we see this sometimes when um, 
you know, we, we may encounter a physician who has never performed a brain death exam and they're six or seven years out of, um, they're six or seven years in practice. It's just not that frequent a deal. And one of the things that we try to tell people is, okay, if you're encountering this physician, first of all, you wanna make sure this is right. <laughs> you know, there's resources out there and that sort of thing. And so we try to find the best way to sort of point that physician to that sort of data that can give him that level of comfort if he's going to proceed. What's, what's your thoughts on um, a situation like that? So as you know, people are very uncomfortable if they're doing something for the first time. The other thing is, if whatever they're doing is a definitive kind of decision, right? Like brain death, you right. don't go back on it. Once you've made the decision, the patient is brain dead. You can't 20 minutes later say, oh, wait, I think they're really okay. Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> right, right. So, so you have to figure out a way to kind of well, to alleviate a lot of their anxiety. One, they're a physician, so they know how to, how to look at a, 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 a pupillary exam. They right. can do a gag. They know how to do this. None of this is really all that difficult. It's just doing it all together, doing it in a systematic fashion, and doing it in a way that they're comfortable with. So it's trying to put them, give them enough data, but not so much, right? You, you don't want to overwhelm them. You want to give them enough data so that they are very, very comfortable in, in the decisions that they're making. I think, Dr. Thompson, sometimes the struggle uh, can be for a non-physician um, yes. to have that conversation with a physician, especially when the non-physician uh, nurse uh, organ procurement organization professional or who, whomever it is, is, has had more exposure while they haven't personally performed the test may have had much more exposure than that physician. Um, it does seem that the data that is presented to physician, one is better received from another physician or if it was published by other physicians. How, how do you best present that data to a physician? Let's say in that kind of brain death scenario, how do you best present this information in a way that the physician appreciates it versus feels like, well, who are you to tell me how to do my job? So if we're going to look at data, why don't we look at how people make decisions? Okay. Decision making. One, if you're an authority figure, people tend to listen to you more. Mm -hmm. Two, if you're a friend, people tend to listen to you more. If you're saying things consistent with what they already believe, they tend to listen to you more. So these are the things that we want to try to fit into. So a nurse trying to tell a physician what to do all, all automatically doesn't really have that authority figure unless that nurse has been doing it for a long time and that physician is very, very junior, like a, a resident, for example. Or what they do for me, Dr. Thompson, is they'll, they'll do something where I don't really realize until afterwards they'll say, well, you know, I heard Dr. Thompson would do X. <laughs> and so yeah. they get that third party validation and they say, well, right. you know, I used to work at the Mayo Clinic and what right. they told me is, and so it's that third party validation if you don't have it. And I think that's another thing that you can do. You want to try again to make the physician as comfortable as possible um, without trying to push him or her into a decision. You want them to come to the decision on their own. You want to present them with this uh, limited, but yet enough data so that they feel comfortable, but not so much data that they feel overwhelmed. You don't want to be condescending, right? Instead, you want to be, you want to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, to be honest with you, experienced nurses are the best at doing that because they've been doing it for years, mm -hmm. right? They've been, they've been telling physicians, they don't really understand what they're seeing at the bedside, or they don't really like what they're seeing at the bedside. They would like the physician to intervene in some sort of way. And so this is something that experienced nurses are very, very good at. Inexperienced nurses and inexperienced doctors are not so good at. So when, when we use the phrase, Dr. Thompson, I really need your help. Can you help me understand what I'm seeing here? 
um, that would come across better than Dr. Thompson doesn't look like you did your brain death examination correctly. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's, 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 although you're saying the exact same thing. Yeah. It is, it is how you present it that's going to make all the difference in the world. And, and we've seen that um, time and time again on how you present information. And when you think about your own, inf- um, your own experience, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a physician assistant, think about how you sometimes just are not receptive to anything that somebody says. Mm-hmm. You're in a bad mood or whatever. And, uh, you know, how they put that across versus when you are um, receptive. Usually it's a friend and you're almost always receptive to something a friend is telling you. Yeah. So we actually have a question from the audience for you, Dr. Thompson. It says, uh, Dr. Thompson, would you say that peer experiences in certain cases would hold as much value or a sense of security as published data? And would a trust of their experience be equivalent of numbers and data? So again, it, it depends upon how, how that's coming out. If I'm going to tell you, if I walk up to you, put my hand on your shoulder and say, hey, look, I have taken care of a thousand women who have delivered babies and this is how you deliver babies. And you go, wait a second, you're a trauma surgeon. That doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't, seem, to, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Um, so it, 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 is, it is a little bit um, discongruous for me to tell you how to deliver a baby. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if, if we're in the middle of a trauma and I say, you know what, I've seen a bunch of gunshot wounds to the chest. I think we need to take this patient to the operating room without presenting any data to you. You're more likely to believe me as a, as a trauma surgeon trying to relate to you in my field of expertise. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it's going to depend upon what data you have, how long and how you present that data as to how somebody should, should receive it. Mm-hmm. Is it as valid? Sure. It can be a, as valid, even more valid than what's, what we've seen in the literature. Again, it's how you present it, whether than how valid it is. So the art and the science. Yes. So what did you say, Dr. Wilson? I said the art and the science. The art and the science, yeah. Dr. Thompson, um, so is qualitative or quantitative data preferable for you? Again, it depends upon the situation. You know, what you want to see when you're reading data, um, you want to see a, a thoughtful presentation of whatever it is that they're studying. You would like to see a lot of numbers, right? I think it's better if you're going to, again, talking about appendicitis, if you're going to look at uh, a study that has 10 patients versus a study that has a thousand patients, Mm -hmm. um, it is possible to mess up a study that has a thousand patients, but, and it's possible to do a really good study on, on a, on a, um, on on a small group of say 10 patients. But again, I would prefer a, a, a well thought out, um, study that has a lot of patients. Sometimes that's not, that's not possible. We've seen that recently, again, in the, in the coronavirus. We saw a study out of France looking at um, uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. That study had only, if I'm not mistaken, the first study had only like 46 patients in it. Right. And, and it, was a, it was not well controlled. So it was one of those studies you look at and go, well, this may be something, but it also may be nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you just have to be critical about what you're reading. Um, I, I don't think you should ever reject what you're reading just because, for example, in that study, it came from France. Well, it's not from, it's not from the Mayo Clinic, so I'm not going to read it. I don't think that makes sense. But instead, you know they have some experience, so let's follow what they, what they have. And I think that I know in our study, in our center, we use those two drugs because those were one of the two drugs that we could get. That's all we could do. So yeah. we're, that was the best we could do for a while for our patients. Yeah. So if anybody has one last question for Dr. Thompson, and while uh, I just want to give people 
a couple of seconds here to maybe submit a question. I did want to ask you, Dr. Thompson, as well, what if you don't, because sometimes, you know, if you're working in a certain area of healthcare, like organ procurement, sometimes there's not a lot of great published data. And we may do our own trending of data over a period of time. Would that be of any value to you in a conversation to say, okay, well, we don't have published data on this right now. Here is what we have been internally trending and identifying. Is, would that carry any value with you? Oh, definitely. No doubt about it. The, the one thing I would, I would suggest and, and um, would like you to emphasize that if you're looking at your own data, to be as rigorous with your data as possible. Mm -hmm. For example, and, and Dr. Wilkins as a trauma surgeon knows this, if, for example, if you're looking at all of your um, organ um, donations, you're looking at all these patients and you've got their age and their disease process and that's it, well, that's probably not enough data to really tell you a whole lot. You know, how did the patient do? Which organs were donated? Um, how did the organs do? Um, who were the organs donated from? Those are the kind of information, the more granular your detail is, even if it's not published, the better it is. Um, I think that's, that's the best way to look at it. Um, data should not be rejected just because it isn't published. Um, you, need to keep your, you need to keep an open mind as a physician to be open to data in any form that it comes at you because it can be helpful. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and this is, this is how a professor's mind thinks, because as soon as you mention that, Haiti, I can see his eyes think about, oh, you've got data to publish it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Nice. Love well, Dr. it. Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate your insights, and we know that you are at work right now, so we want to respect your time. <laughs> yeah, and once again, congratulations. I don't think of anybody that could have been more deserving of the title for professor. So I will have to refer to you as professor now for <laughs> the next couple of times. I'll call up. I'm going to change that in my context. So when you call Thank up, come you. up, professor. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed this conversation. And if you need anything, you just let me know. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good luck to you. you safe, and thank you all that you do. Thank you. All right. Bye, Facebook. Thank you. Soon.